like to introduce you, introduce you to Karen Hammerberg, um, who's going to talk to us to begin with tonight. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to advance my slides here. Here we go. That's me. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. And uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this webinar. I'm just going to talk a little bit first about what we know from research. Um, and there's been lots of uh, international and also Australian studies that show that most people who don't have children, they would like to have children sometime. And they also expect that this will happen. Contrary to what might be a bit of a stereotype is that men actually want children as much as women do. Even among young men, we know from research that most actually aspire to parenthood and expect to become fathers sometime. But we also know that most people have rather limited knowledge about the factors that affect fertility. There are, of course, lots of factors that affect fertility. And uh, uh, we also know that there are lots of different causes of infertility. And they will be uh, discussed later on. But there are some potentially modifiable factors that actually have a great influence on fertility and the chance of, of having a baby. First and foremost, it's the age of the parent, but also body weight, whether people smoke or not, uh, to a degree alcohol consumption, but also timing of intercourse. These factors are. Um, potentially, as I said, modifiable. And therefore, I think they're really interesting to, uh, to target in, in uh, public education. What we know about age is that for women, uh, fertility does actually start to decline uh, when a woman is in her early 30s. The, the decline is very slow at the beginning. But, but by about age 35, the decline uh, speeds up. Uh, it's estimated by, that by about age 40, uh, fertility is only about half of what it was when the woman was younger. Some say that the monthly chance of conceiving is about 20% uh, when you're 30, but it's down to 5% when you're 40. So there is definitely a decline in um, infertility. But not only that, uh, if you do conceive when you're older, your risk of miscarriage uh, is, is actually much greater. And also, there is, there is an increased risk of uh, obstetric and also neonatal complications that, that are associated with increasing age. With male infertility, that's a little bit more subtle, but it does, it does actually also, over time, men's um, fertility and the quality of the sperm does decline. And uh, more or less around about age 45, it's estimated that this is, this is noticeable. So there has been studies that show that time to pregnancy for, for a woman who's uh, with a partner of uh, who's 45 or older is significantly, significantly longer than for uh, a woman who has a partner who is younger. We also know that um, associated with older paternal age is an increased risk that the, the, the child that he's fathering has an increased risk of autism spectrum disorders and, and schizophrenia. And of course, uh, th these are still small uh, risks we're talking about, uh, because most children are, of course, born healthy. But uh, there is a, a noticeable increased risk uh, that's associated with the father's age. Now, with this uh, as a backdrop, uh, it was quite concerning. Um, now, here's another poll. Let's see what, what happens here. This is about um, whether you would recommend women preparing for pregnancy. Um, we'll leave that one on for a little bit. Okay, we've got all sorts of colors here. Okay, that might be that might be it. Thank you for that. Yes, so we, um, where I work, we did a study some time ago, um, which was uh, asking people of reproductive age who said that they wanted to have a child now or in the future, uh, what they knew about uh, various aspects of fertility. And it was quite concerning to find that most of them underestimated, by about 10 years, the age when fertility starts to decline. So about a third of the women and about half of the men, they either didn't know when female fertility starts to decline, or they thought that this happens after the age of 40. About a third of both women and men thought that male fertility starts to decline after 50. 
There are also some lifestyle factors that, that influence fertility, and these will be discussed in more detail later. But uh, things like obesity and smoking actually affect the environment where sperm and egg develop, and this can cause epigenetic changes, uh, and they can adversely affect the health of the offspring. Alcohol is a little bit more tricky. There is a dose-dependent relationship, but there is, uh, with heavy drinking, certainly it's known that this has an effect on fertility, but also obviously on the, uh, it poses risk to the unborn child. Now, there are some trends uh, that are worth discussing in this context, and um, one of them is, uh, and we probably will know that, that, that uh, we have an increasing age of childbearing. So uh, it's gone from around about 27 some years ago, and it's now about uh, the average maternal age in Australia is about 30. Uh, nearly a quarter of women who give birth are aged over 35. There are very many good reasons why, uh, why age of childbearing is, in is increasing, and one of them is, of course, that there's really reliable contraception now, so we don't have too many unwanted pregnancies. We also have women spend more time in education and, and spend time establishing a career and doing all the things that we all want to do. The whole thing of delayed childbearing is often framed as something that women uh, are responsible for and somehow um, do just because they have better things to do than, than becoming mothers. But we have done some research, research that actually shows that not finding a partner and or not finding a partner who's willing to commit to parenthood is one of the main reasons why women have children later. So it's very important that we remember to include men in these conversations because they are clearly part of the problem but also should be part of the solution. There are also, of course, a lot of structural factors that, that, that need to be addressed, but I'll get, get back to that later on. There's also an increasing prevalence of overweight and obesity. A, a large proportion of men of the, uh, and women in reproductive years are uh, either overweight or obese. Uh, smoking rates are decreasing, but there's still one in seven Australians of reproductive age is a smoker. And the a proportion of, of people in this age group actually have um, consume alcohol at uh, risky levels. The other thing that is perhaps less uh, um, recognized as a factor that does influence the chance of, of conceiving is whether or not people understand or are aware of the fertile window in the menstrual cycle. So obviously conception is only possible uh, during a few days in the menstrual cycle and uh, the research I referred to before and also other studies uh, have shown that generally speaking uh, there is rather poor awareness of, of how the menstrual cycle operates and that there are these limited days when uh, uh, conception is possible. So these are things that, that potentially could be addressed by uh, education. So the consequences of, of the factors I've discussed is that uh, they, they do increase the risk of, of childlessness altogether, but also, and perhaps more commonly, that, that people have fewer children than they had planned to have. So the window of opportunity is narrower, and therefore, uh, and other factors play in, and uh, you might have thought you'd have three children, but you end up having two, or, or you might have one. There is, of course, more age-related infertility, for, because uh, if, if you wait long enough, uh, the chance of conception is, is lower, and you can be technically described as infertile, but it has a, a cause, and, and the cause is that, that uh, age has reduced your chance of conceiving. So with all this, we see an increased use of assisted reproductive technologies, and uh, as, as we know and are aware, and Raylia will discuss this later, these these technologies are very helpful for, for, for many people, but they also are associated with quite a lot of psychological, physical, and financial costs. And for those who are able to avoid those, um, that would be the preferable way. Now, there's not one answer to all these questions, but I think there are some, some uh, obvious things that, that uh, might, might help or perhaps uh, um, things to, to think about that, that we could do to improve uh, awareness about these factors and, and potentially help people achieve their childbearing goals. Firstly, school curricula, I think, needs to go beyond um, informing uh, children about and, and, and adolescents about how to avoid pregnancy and um, STIs. There is a place, definitely, I think, in, in the... Um, in school curricula for educating young people about ways to protect fertility and, and the thought that um, you can turn off fertility with contraception but you can't always turn it on when you want to unless you have the right ingredients. 
I also think that uh, health promotion programs have a place. I work with uh, the Your Fertility program and we have, we have uh, produced a lot of uh, material and, and I think we have quite a, a big reach with, with our uh, health promotion uh, messages and hopefully some of them will help people make decisions that, that might help them achieve their parenting goals. We also uh, think, of course, for, for people like yourselves in the primary care settings, that there are lots of opportunities to introduce discussions about reproductive life planning and to provide preconception health care, which is what we're talking about tonight. But also, uh, there, there, is, there are lots of resources out there, and there will be quite a few of those in your little box down there that, that can help start these conversations and, and resources that hopefully can make it a bit easier to uh, address this topic. I think that's it for me, and um, we should hand over to um, Sandra. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think there's lots of things to think about there, and um, we'll also be including a lot of ways to try and bring um, the discussion about fertility and, and preconception care into your clinical practice, I think. Now, Sandra Valella is going to talk to us now about nutrition and lifestyle um, as it relates to preconception. Thanks, Lou. So what I'm going to talk about is some lifestyle and nutritional factors that have an impact on fertility. And so what we know, particularly with nutrition and also with environmental factors and, and lifestyle factors, is that it, that particularly with nutrition, it doesn't necessarily just mean that there, we're addressing deficiencies that might mean that may impair the, the chances of conceiving, but also these things have an impact on preventing birth defects and miscarriage rate and also the development of the um, embryo as, and, and the impact on the sperm and the egg. And we know that there are many factors, nutrition and lifestyle, that can affect, impact on epigenetics and how this impacts the development of the embryo and also the offspring and the chances of health impacts on the offspring as well. So we'll start off with some basic ones like smoking. So smoking, smokers are more likely to be infertile and also women who are exposed to smoking take longer to conceive. And we do know that there is a lower birth rate, a birth weight and birth defects associated with mothers who smoke and they do go through menopause earlier. So that can mean that they shorten their chances of getting pregnant. It can also, of course, damage sperm DNA. If you look at caffeine, then there, in terms of affecting fertility, some resources say that two caffeinated drinks or two cups of coffee are okay. I would suggest limiting it to one cup, and we know that any more than 300 milligrams of caffeine a day can impact the chances of miscarriage. Some sources say that alcohol, there's no evidence in terms of it influencing the chances of conceiving, but certainly when you do are pregnant to avoid it because uh, it can impact on the, on the health of the developing fetus. What's really important is to highlight the how important a good diet is. And I like this pyramid because it, as you can see, the bottom part of the pyramid is, high, is really emphasizing a high amount of fruit and vegetables. And really, if the take home message is to increase the amount of fruit and vegetables, that's going to be a useful message to take home. But what that does mean as a breakdown is that what we want to encourage our women to have is a whole food diet and avoid processed foods. And by doing that, we're avoiding a lot of the health, unhealthy fats, unhealthy sugars as well. And by crowding out the unhealthy choices with healthy choices, so making half the plate vegetables, it leaves less room for these unhealthy choices. Brightly coloured fruit and vegetables will allow us to have more of these antioxidants and anti-inflammatory foods. As you'll see, we, uh, inflammation is a big part of most non-communicable diseases these days, including fertility. And you know, just doing things like having sweet potato and potato instead of potato, having spinach instead of iceberg, adding grated beetroot to the salad sandwich, any opportunity there is to increase the vegetables. Lean protein, really important. Um, there's some interesting studies looking at even uh, protein deficiency around the time of conception and how that can affect the epigenetics of, of the developing um, of the embryo. 
So a fist size is the general recommendation, a, a combination of animal sources and also vegetarian sources including legumes can be useful. And looking at fish three times a week to provide us with the essential fatty acids, the omega-3 fatty acids which are really important, but also avoiding the fish that are higher up in the food chain which are higher in mercury and possibly some environmental toxins like flake, swordfish, fresh tuna, sea perch and marlin. If you make a general rule of having whole grains rather than white, then that is a good message to take home. A small handful of raw nuts is, seems to have an impact on a lot of uh, impact on general health. Walnuts would be ones, almonds, also macadamia nuts. And the good oils, particularly when you're looking at trying to manipulate inflammation, you want to decrease the bad fats that are generally found in commercial ba baked goods and have more of the olive oil, macadamia, avocado, flaxseed oil. And then of course just to keep a balance, sometimes food, sometimes only so that we're not making it all too rigid. We have included a, a preconception care diet in the downloads and that will give you a little bit more information about that. In terms of an antenatal supplementation, it was interesting to see the results of that poll that a lot of people are still prescribing just folic acid on its own. Now I would suggest a three months prior to conception to start with antenatal supplementation. The National Health and Medical Research Council recommends starting particularly folic acid one month before and to continue for three months during pregnancy. So the folic acid recommendations are 500 micrograms. You may see now in some formulations a folinic acid which is the next step down in the folic acid metabolism and it bypasses that rate limiting step in the folic acid metabolism. Some practitioners are using it and may or may not be useful for some of the polymorphisms that might be associated with folic acid deficiency but you'll see this in combination. More doesn't necessarily mean better and what is absolutely essential is that folic acid on its own is no longer considered enough. It, it does absolutely need these cofactors of B6, B12 and B2 and you'll, that's really important for the metabolism of folic acid. So folic acid in isolation is really limiting what you're offering to the patients. With iodine, as you're probably aware, Australians are now more iodine deficient because the dairy industry used to use iodine as their sanitising agents and we had iodine leached into our milk and our dairy source was a good source of iodine. At any one time there are about 150,000 Australian women who are pregnant women who are iodine deficient and 20 to 30,000 who are, suffer from overt subclinical overt or subclinical hypothyroidism and this is often due to um, uh, autoimmune um, thyroiditis. It's mostly undiagnosed. So iodine is really important. The World Health Organization recommend 250 micrograms. National Health and Medical Research recommend 150. We do get some in our fortified breads, uh, not organic breads though, and the, the needs increase during breastfeeding to 270. Zinc is also really important and especially important for male factors and with vitamin D it may just be useful to make sure that women are getting about 1600 to 400 international, use, international units daily. There is, there, there is over testing, well the, the Medicare have come down on um, testing of vitamin D in in 11 years, so 2001, the amount of money that was spent um, on testing vitamin D was $1 million. In 2012, that was a $143 million worth of Medicare testing with vitamin D. There was a big study done in a couple of years ago looking at women from Monash Hospital, over 1,500 women who were pregnant and 90% of those women were either vitamin D insufficient or deficient, so under 50 nanomoles per, or, or, not under the, or under the 75. So it may actually be more cost effective to just implement this 1600 to 400 and these are the recommendations that some of the experts are talking about to get the levels to at least 50 and some of the recommendations are looking at the levels in pregnancy may actually need to be higher, 80 nanomoles or possibly 100. 
What we don't know is whether there is some research showing that vitamin D in pregnancy has an impact on pregnancy outcomes, like reducing the risk of gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, but it possibly is the impact that it has on the offspring and prevents the deficiency of vitamin D for the offspring and that has some good implications. So for example, you know, preventing the risk of HIV and other, and other health factors. So what we will also talk about is obesity. And in, when we have a patient in the room, we have to really address, so to speak, the elephant in the room and, and address the obesity. Um, but we'll just have a look at this first poll and see what we think about what your, you think the chances are of conceiving for a 40-year-old woman, what her monthly chances of conceiving are. Okay, so it looks like that's slowing down a bit now and looks like the majority of people are looking at around the 5%. So we can close that off. Thank you. Okay, so what we do know is that obesity is not only associated with multiple adverse reproductive outcomes, there's um, ovulation dysfunction, so usually there are unovulation and ovulatory cycles, miscarriage and infertility, and of course there are implications during the pregnancy such as fetal growth restriction and gestational diabetes, as well as preeclampsia. Um, there, there are multiple um, proposed mechanisms and often it's because of this altered hormonal milieu but really because what it is is this chronic inflammation that's occurring. So adipose tissue is now seen as an active organ rather than an inert organ and there are these adip adipokines and basically a whole heap of inflammatory cytokines that are associated with this inflammation process being produced from these fat in the fat and also there's an increased risk of miscarriage with hyperinsulinemia. Maternal weight loss is really important and basically can help not only to improve the chances of ovulation but also improve the chances of conceiving more quickly and decrease miscarriage rates. So um, women and, and, and couples should actually be talked about in terms of at their first consultation looking at whether they're obese and overweight and be counselled on how to decrease their weight. And in fact if BMI over 35 is recognised as a risk factor in pregnancy and delivery and is also regarded as a contraindication for um, ART. And the good news is, is only a small amount of weight loss is needed, 5 to 10% of body weight, which will help to resume ovulation and improve pregnancy late rate. So what we do know that even with women who are ovulating, they still actually can have an increase, their chances of getting pregnant with being overweight is also takes longer. The best diet is, in terms of the research, looks at energy restriction, but probably a low GI and high protein are preferable. And exercise not only decreases adipose tissue, but reduces inflammation that's associated with it. And there are international guidelines for obesity management in terms of the exercise. Other considerations to look at all of the other particular drugs, occupational um, hazards, things like uh, environmental to toxins that may have some impact. There is increasing evidence to show that they may impact on male and female infertility. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. We've actually had a question come in about recommendations, um, nutrition, uh, nutrient recommendations in New Zealand and being different to Australia. And I mean, I know we're actually, these webinars are sort of focusing on an Australian audience, but we do have some viewers from New Zealand on the line. So do you have those have at your fingertips? Um, look, it's interesting. With 800 micrograms, that's in one of the major over-the-counter um, antenatal formulas, which is, of course, um, Elevit, it has 800 micrograms. Look, there's some increasing evidence showing that more can is not necessarily best. Um, there may be some increased chances of what's called unmetabolized folic acid. There are some times when five milligrams are recommended, particularly if there's been a previous pregnancy with neural tube defects. And um, so the, it just may be a difference. But I would just say that it's really important to make sure that those cofactors are are included if there is going to be that higher dose of folic acid. Thanks. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Sandra. And there's a couple of other questions coming in about supplements, but um, we actually will cover this a little bit more when we get to our case studies shortly. So um, Sandra will, will comment on that. So now I'd like to introduce Raylia. Raylia is going to talk about... Um, sorry, did you hear that? <laughs> sorry, we're going to talk about that um, during the case studies about other supplements. Uh, Raylia is going to talk to us about fertility from the um, perspective of a obstetrician gynaecologist and fertility specialist. Thanks, Riley. Thanks for having me, Louise. Um, so I deal with IVF in my daily practice at Melbourne IVF um, and this is a very common uh, presentation, women who have trouble getting pregnant and um, perceive IVF as a panacea that's going to solve um, all their problems. But um, unfortunately that is not always the case. Uh, and um, we know that IVF is a fantastic technology that has helped literally millions of babies be born around the world that might not have um, without its um, amazing advantage. However, um, IVF does have its limitations. IVF can dramatically improve pregnancy rates when there's a severe male factor, specifically using ICSI. For women who have blocked fallopian tubes or have had ectopic pregnancies and have no functioning fallopian tubes, um, perhaps they've had tuberculosis, perhaps they've had pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, perhaps they've had severe scarring from endometriosis. Uh, we also know that in fully investigated unexplained idiopathic infertility, IVF certainly does increase the chance of conception um, significantly. So what, why, where is the limitation of IVF? Um, we really find that with the advancing age of our maternal populations, uh, IVF uh, can't make eggs um, better, stronger, more able to make a baby. Uh, when we see uh, from Karen's slide that the average age of uh, first maternity is over 30, we have to consider that 50% of maternities are in fact on the older side of that spectrum uh, and a significant proportion are um, closer to 40. Uh, and that's when it becomes really hard and I, I frequently see uh, women who've been able to conceive one baby but really struggle to conceive a sibling uh, for their child uh, and waiting too long is a major factor. So why do we find it hard to help women um, who are uh, of a more advancing maternal age? And um, just a caveat that advanced maternal age um, is really defined as maternal age over the age of 35 and I think uh, a major problem is as women and, and you know, as a society, we don't perceive 35-year-olds as old. We, we perceive them as very young socially and, um, and that is part of the problem. Uh, in terms of women over 35, uh, not only does the risk of abnormalities spontaneously arising in eggs um, increase dramatically and the risk of aneuploidy, uh, conditions such as Down syndrome, but just any other spontaneous uh, aneuploidy that randomly occurs uh, becomes much more frequent. Uh, as does the risk of miscarriage. We also see lower fertilisation rates, lower numbers of usable eggs and embryos that can be achieved. Uh, and um, this is a real challenge when combined with the increased risk of abnormal eggs and abnormal embryos. So this is um, data coming from ANZAD, our Australia and New Zealand um, database that monitors IVF. Uh, outcomes and live birth outcomes. So we can see that uh, the live birth rate at age uh, 40 years is less than 5% per cycle. We can see that soberingly over 43 years is less than 1% per cycle. And um, we all must remember that the cost of an IVF cycle to the taxpayer is approximately $10,000 um, for cycles. Uh, it's not what the um, patients uh, are charged because they have their Medicare rebates, but that's what it costs the government in terms of medications and procedures. Uh, so um, here comes a poll question. Um, so I'd like um, you to consider uh, this question. Do you engage male patients in discussions about fertility in your practice? Okay, thank you very much um, and we'll share that um, so you can see the, the um, spread of responses.
So uh, I'll just canvas some risk factors for infertility and things that you might um, identify in your own patients as well as increasing age. Um, so if, if a patient has had um, previously sexually transmitted infections such as chlamydia, it's worth screening for, uh, very prevalent still. If they have endometriosis or family history of endometriosis, specifically in a sibling, the risk becomes quite significant um, even in a patient who is relatively asymptomatic. Asherman syndrome is something that you want to think about if menses have stopped or dramatically reduced for an unexplained um, reason or after a, um, a pregnancy or, or a, a procedure. Uh, and fibroids uh, can be quite silent but still cause issues with fertility. And that is a tricky subject. Um, there's um, no real consensus that treating fibroids um, that don't distort the uterine cavity actually improves fertility. We know that having them is not good, but um, treating them doesn't necessarily uh, improve the outcome for a woman. So in my practice, I tend to reserve my amectomy for women who are very symptomatic or have a fibroid that severely distorts the uterine cavity uh, because obviously uh, it, it, it carries a significant uh, amount of risk when you do a myomectomy and, and one of the, the worst things that can happen is a hysterectomy resulting um, from complications of surgery and in a childbearing um, woman who's seeking fertility, that's not, um, not something I would undertake lightly. In terms of other risk factors for fertility, we mustn't forget iatrogenic causes such as chemo radio radiotherapy um, in our uh, quest to treat cancers earlier in life, um, surgical removal of an ovary due to a complication or due to a, um, a pathology. Um, and also, of course, Karen spoke um, and, uh, and Sandra also uh, spoke about obesity and smoking as um, very difficult uh, problems to, um, to face, but, but reversible causes of subfertility. So why do women delay having babies? And I, I think, um, you know, we really need to talk about why couples delay having babies. Um, and what is the ideal age of, of fatherhood as well as what is the ideal age of motherhood and what does our society um, suggest to us? And, and um, I would controversially perhaps say that in terms of um, young men, society puts very little pressure um, or, or gives very little guidance on young men to, to become fathers at a young age. Uh, and that really does um, put a lot of the onus and a lot of the responsibility perhaps unfairly uh, on women. And in, in my patients, I really find, particularly my patients who come to talk about egg freezing, um, I find that the main reason that they are not able to or face having a baby by themselves at that point in time is that they haven't got a partner and that their vision of having a family involved having a committed and involved partner. Um, and that's the main reason in their minds that they are not trying to have a baby versus um, freezing eggs or, or just coming for advice. Uh, and often I have patients who, uh, whose partners are not committed um, to parenthood where they themselves might be and it, it's very difficult. So I think that's not only a medical question but it's also a social question that we all need to buy in on a little bit. Um, of course education and career um, have a part to play but I think those are often demonised um, causes of this much more complex problem. Having babies later in life does increase the risk to both mother and child uh, and having a, a pregnancy over uh, 40 certainly increases your risk of, of significant comorbidities like hypertension, uh, gestational diabetes uh, and these in turn increase your risk of um, having preeclampsia, of having a baby that's born prematurely and all of the consequences of, of preterm birth. Uh, we also see an increased uh, risk of the opposite of macrosomia and of um, neonatal hypoglycemia after birth, an increased risk of both operative delivery and also um, complications postnatally such as postpartum incontinence um, increasing with advanced maternal age. So in, in practice, uh, one important point I wanted to make is about timing of referral. Um, in recognising the biological definition, if not the social definition, of advanced maternal age. Because if you refer your patient in a timely manner where their fertility um, has not declined 
um, to the point of no return, then you know it, it does you know make my job as a fertility specialist much easier to help them. Um, and I generally you know think it's the right thing to do to refer a woman after six months of subfertility um, if she's over the age of 35, uh, taking into account not only the fact that she um, is keen to conceive her first baby, but also potentially factoring in that she may want to have more than one baby and that for the second baby and potentially any subsequent pregnancies, um, time, time does have a, an impact in whether they are able to occur or not. Um, I think it's really good in, in uh, primary care to investigate women trying to conceive um, and not leave them on their own um, even after six months. Certainly um, it, it doesn't hurt to do a sperm test. I think it's very reasonable um, to ensure that um, the quality is, is, is normal. Uh, to make sure, you know, by both taking a history of the menstrual cycle and also potentially confirming with um, luteal phase progesterone that ovulation is occurring. And specifically if there's a history of any uh, sexually transmitted infections, but also if you have any concerns about endometriosis, premenstrual symptoms, um, to check if the fallopian tubes ha are patent. Also important in um, women from um, overseas origins, if they've been in a country where tuberculosis is prevalent, um, or if they themselves have a past history of tuberculosis, um, checking the fallopian tubes is a very good idea. Um, just another note on egg freezing. If you're going to freeze your eggs, the best time to do it is a time where the egg quality will be useful to you in the future. And so egg freezing um, is no panacea, but if you're going to do it, the best time is in your early 30s. Um, I say that from both a social and a biological perspective. If you're in your early 30s and you haven't had a baby yet um, and you don't envisage yourself having one in the very near future, um, then putting some eggs aside for the future is a, an idea that's um, you know, something that can be quite reassuring. I always tell my patients who come for egg freezing that it shouldn't be their plan A, um, but it's a plan B that our mothers and even our older sisters had no access to and technology facilitates very good outcomes now. Um, unfortunately, Medicare has no funding um, in Australia. Um, I'm not sure of the situation in New Zealand, but I think it's similar. And so patients who freeze eggs, uh, they are liable for the full amount of the cost of the cycle. And in most cases, it's close to $10,000. So it's not a decision to be taken lightly. The limits of IVF. Um, we have no cure for the effects of ovarian ageing. And we can't do very much in our lab or in our stimulation protocols to dramatically enhance egg quality. Um, so in, in that sense, IVF is of limited benefit to older women. However, um, what it can do is procure more eggs um, per cycle and so give women more chances, more bites of the cherry, so to speak. And that's how we really help women um, who are approaching and over the age of 40. Over 45 in um, Melbourne IVF4I practice, um, all women presenting for treatment must use donor eggs from younger um, donors uh, because um, the statistical chance of pregnancy is such that um, treatment is, is considered futile using your own eggs at that point with less than a 1% chance of live birth per cycle. So I'll just hand back to Louise. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Raylia. Some lots of things to consider there, and I think some of this will become, um, re, you know, reaffirmed during the case studies. So the first one we're going to do um, is kind of that talking about that idea of opportunistic discussions around fertility and reproductive planning. So these are two presentations completely unrelated to reproductive you know, consultations, um, but Karen is going to sort of talk about some of the ways you can approach this um, in your practice. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Louise. Well, um, I guess uh, 
primary healthcare providers can't be everything to, to everyone, and I know they're really under time pressure most of the time, but there may be opportunities in primary care to introduce the topic of, um, of fertility and, and, and thinking about um, the, the kind of the future and, in term, and whether that involves having children. Um, there are some college guidelines uh, which relate to, to this topic, and they, they recommend that we develop a help patients develop a reproductive life plan that includes whether they want to have children. So that's obviously the first question, whether they really want to have children, but also whether how many they would like to have and what they think about the spacing. Do they want to have them close together or a few years in between? Uh, and the timing of intended children, because that will give quite a few clues about the kind of uh, advice that we might have to give. Uh, there is also, of course, a recommendation that everything is done where possible, where, where a, a pregnancy is planned, uh, that everything is done to optimize health before conception uh, occurs. So I, I think there may be opportunities in primary health care to, to bring up the, the topic. And obviously, um, most mostly so, perhaps in the reproductive health consultations, a, a young woman who comes, or a woman in her reproductive years who comes for a pap smear or contraceptive counselling, or um, a young man who comes for an STI check, or a young woman who comes for any STI check as well. That, that this, this is obviously an open opportunity to talk about whether they, they have any plans for uh, having children in the future. But perhaps even in other consultations, if uh, if if the topic is it may be possible to bring it up. And I, I have just found something that I think is quite an interesting approach, and that's a Canadian group that have come up with this one key question concept. So their idea is that in a, in a consultation about pretty much anything, there is one question you can always ask, and that's whether someone would like to become pregnant in the next year. They have a website, and I encourage you to look at that, because I think it is um, it is an interesting concept, and if it's woven into to, uh, consultations, I think it could give a lot of opportunities to, to discuss this. So they suggest that this is asked uh, routinely so that uh, more pregnancies are, in fact, wanted, planned, and as healthy as possible. Now, um, it would, of course, then, if the person says yes, you could, the, the whole um, um, cascade of, of, of um, uh, information that that is possible to to um, to share at that point is is quite considerable, and I'm I'm not suggesting that that would take place there and there. But I think if the if the answer is yes, I think there's an opportunity to say, well, there are a lot of things that uh, would be good for you to know, and uh, perhaps if if you think it's going to happen in the next uh, number of months, perhaps make an appointment and come back and see me, and we can we can discuss these, and we can make sure that you have the best possible chance of achieving your pregnancy if you want one. But also, if the person says no, I think it is an opportunity to make sure or discuss whether they have ad adequate contraception, and perhaps then uh, make a note and ask again in a year's time. There are in a number of useful tools, and, and quite a few of them uh, I have put in this uh, amongst the documents that you can that you can access, because I think it's not always. Um, easy to, to, to share all this information, especially with time constraints. But there are, uh, for, for those who are perhaps thinking about it within the next year or so, there are some uh, pretty simple but, but useful tools that you could hand out. So there's something about how uh, to help people understand ovulation and, and obviously the fertile window in the menstrual cycle. There is a, a fact sheet that I've also put in, in your resources, which is really the factors that, that you know, someone who's planning a pregnancy or, or might want to have a baby sometimes should think about, and it's it's always better to think about these things before conception, obviously, as we've discussed before. And there is also a fact sheet for health professionals, which gives them the, 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 the kind of facts and figures about the factors that affect fertility and, and um, you know, how they can share this with, with their patients. There's also an excellent uh, tool developed by APNA, the Australian Practice Nurses Association, and I highly recommend that. This is a family planning decision tool, which obviously deals with contraceptive care, but also uh, the kind of discussions that might arise if someone says that they want to have um, a baby in the nearer future. This is just a look of the um, uh, thinking about having a baby resource that I put in your, uh, in your resources. 
and uh, this is the one about understanding ovulation. And I think these are very simple things to do. They wouldn't take much time, uh, but it might just, especially uh, understanding when, when someone is fertile in the menstrual cycle, might, might be a very simple uh, way of, of improving chances. So also in that context, I guess it is an opportunity then to talk about the importance of starting the, the, the vitamin supplements before conception. So it's ideally, as Sandra said, perhaps three months before conception. And um, if, if, if a pregnancy just happens, there's not that opportunity. But there is, if there is a, some, some kind of inclination that it might happen, it is a good idea to suggest that, that um, the woman starts taking these multivitamins. There's also an opportunity to discuss how uh, the diet can be improved so that um, uh, it, it is as good as it can be uh, to, to be uh, as optimum as possible for, for pregnancy and for uh, fertility first and then pregnancy. I think that's all for me and um, someone will do the next one. Okay, thank you Karen. I think it's, um, it's really good that people, there were quite a lot of people who were actually talking about um, fertility and, and preconception planning or um, earlier on. But I think you know there's ways that probably we can tip over into the into the next into the next level of doing it as a regular thing. I know there's lots of things to do in a consultation, but I think it's a really important thing. Um, so now we're going to look at um, our case study two or scenario one. So we've got a, um, this is kind of the idea of people who would like to have children but are not in a position to be able to have one at the moment. So um, Raylia is going to start off with this case study. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, this is a, a patient group that I see more and more of in my practice um, and I often do opportunistically speak about fertility to women who I see for other reasons like contraception or a pap smear checkup um, to just raise awareness and, and give them choices because knowledge does empower women um, to make informed choices in their future. So uh, this is a case of a woman who is um, approaching kind of her, well, her, the years of her peak fertility um, and, and, and beyond and still hasn't had a baby. Um, but would love to be a mum someday if she found the right person. So this is a rather depressing graph <laughs> that you'll see used over and over again in fertility um, presentations. But uh, this is egg number on the um, on on this axis here, and um, uh, maternal age on the x-axis. And you can see that um, we're born with all the eggs we're ever going to have as females, and that. Um, down here at age 51 at the time of average age of menopause we have um, very few, less than a thousand eggs in, in both our ovaries. Uh, and um, in the middle, uh, the peak of, of my IVF population. So um, we've talked about egg quality declining with age but also egg number. And the reality is that not every 35 year old is the same. Some women will have uh, a good ovarian reserve at the same age that another woman has a very diminished ovarian reserve. But we do know that the ovarian reserve that a woman has does impact on our ability to help her have a baby with IVF, um, mainly by impacting the number of eggs that can be achieved um, in a single IVF cycle or an egg-free cycle for that matter. So uh, in terms of my patient who's come and she's you know, in her early 30s, not with a partner, wanting to have a baby one day, um, future planning is really important. Um, and um, it's important to talk to your patients about this. Have you thought about having a baby? Um, are you aware of female fertility limitations? Um, would you like me to refer you to a specialist to discuss this further? It's worth considering AMH screening. Um, certainly under 35, um, you know, between 28 and 35, you can argue that that might influence a woman. Her ovarian reserve might influence the options that she has um, kind of on the table in the future in terms of both um, egg freezing and also in terms of IVF. In terms of immediate action though, even if women don't want to be um, interventional um, and take kind of extreme proactive measures, um, you can give them good contraception advice 
Um, you know, you can make sure that you reinforce messages of safe sex in, in um, new relationships so that they don't um, contract sexually transmitted infection that might impair their fertility in the future. In terms of lifestyle advice, um, it's much better to stop smoking and um, kind of be of a healthy body weight. That will in, in turn improve your chance of having a baby in the future. And of course, cervical surveillance, making sure that pap smears are up to date, um, making sure that, that you know we can avoid things like um, late treatment, cone biopsy, um, you know, treatments that, that potentially do complicate pregnancies down the line. And in, in that kind of primary health care, health promotion um, aspect, Action Now will prevent future problems. Um, so the AMH test is something that a lot of people worry about and, and um, you know, often I'm asked the question, should this be done in primary care? And, um, you know, the question is maybe, um, I guess it's like with any test, what are you going to do with it is, is you know, kind of um, the answer and will it generate anxiety um, in excess or will it give women more choice? And what is AMH anyway? So AMH stands for anti-malarian hormone. It's a hormone made, um, you'll remember in embryology, um, it, it's involved in the differentiation um, of, of the male. In the female and in the ovary, it's made uh, by primordial follicles. We think it plays a role in um, suppressing growth of follicles. So why don't we lose all those eggs in one go in your first menstrual cycle? Something stopping them and keeping them in suspended animation and it's a complex array of hormones that does that, but AMH is one of them. And um, it's expressed by the follicles you can't see on ultrasound, the, the primordial follicles and um, the preantral follicles as opposed to the, the antral follicles, which are defined as two to nine millimetres in, in diameter. They're the ones that you count in the follicular phase. Uh, and you can see here by this graph that the, um, the AMH has a huge range, um, even in women of the same age. Uh, and it's normally distributed, just like other population parameters. We know that it correlates with the density of ovarian follicles in the ovary, and therefore we can correlate it to how we will we'll perform in an IVF cycle. We use it in IVF to reduce a woman's risk of hyperstimulation by dose adjusting um, stimulation regimens. We can also use it to prognosticate, to um, you know, kind of predict how a woman um, will behave in her first IVF cycle and that's really what it's for. Um, in terms of egg freezing, um, it's a test that women do to tell us a bit about their egg number. It does not have any implications on their egg quality and egg quality is very much related to biological age. Um, so there will be 35 year olds who can get 20 eggs and there will be 35 year olds who can get 3 eggs in an IVF cycle. The quality per egg will be very similar between those individuals. Um, AMH will differentiate between um, the number of eggs that a woman might, ex might expect to achieve but not um, in terms of the quality. Having said that, um, there is a complex interplay because the more eggs you have available um, in a cycle, the more chance you'll have of finding that inverted common golden egg that's going to be your baby. Um, so um, it does have a relationship with um, with live birth and it does have a relationship um, with prognosis of an IVF population. If anybody is nervous about doing the AMH test in primary care, um, if a patient really would like to have it done, um, I would suggest just uh, handball the patient onto a fertility specialist um, to have that difficult conversation. <laughs> um, moving my slide along. Um, I've skipped one, I'm just going to go back. Okay, so one of the slides that I, that I would have um, liked to show you is not coming up but um, uh, hopefully it will come towards the end. Oh, here we go. Thank you tech people. Um, so I just wanted to put a little plug of Your Fertility which is a, a campaign that um, I've been involved with through my work in VARTA. Um, your Fertility is a fantastic resource for both uh, yourselves and your patients. Um, it's a really nice um, web-based um, and a very um, categorical um, information resource with quality information that you can direct patients to to find out more about what they can do to modify their lifestyle and um, achieve fertility and also to get um, kind of some, a nice volume and, and well-directed 
um, information that, that might help them clarify these questions. Lifestyle and nutrition um, has been covered by both Sandra um, and also Karen, but um, I can't leave it out um, in terms of um, in terms of you know factors that are important to talk to patients about. Um, particularly, I have, I have a lot of patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome um, who can avoid fertility treatment um, through specialist care um, by modifying lifestyle. And Sandra um, mentioned that even a modest reduction in weight and just a reset of the hypothalamic um, axis, just, just changing that status quo, mixing it up, 5 to 10 percent weight loss, a lot of women will, will regain um, ovulation and, and therefore natural fertility. Um, so, um, so that's really important. Also stress minimisation and management. Um, I believe that stress has a big role to play, uh, particularly in infertility, also in IVF, probably in um, you know how often people have sex. Um, I think it's really important um, to both, you know, kind of um, reinforce, uh, you know, the the benefits of seeking help and seeking counselling, and also um, letting kind of the um, the patient feel that you know they don't have to be in the closet about having having difficulty uh, conceiving. Um, and you know, there's also a lot of stress in in the patient in in the case you know where people don't have a partner, and um, they're really worried about um, about their fertility and their ability to have a baby in the future. It might stop them getting out there and meeting someone because they're interviewing their date um, the first time they meet them for a potential fatherhood. So um, it's important to really address these factors. So the second part of my case is a 38 plus year old who would love to be a mum but hasn't met the right partner yet. And um, I don't generally uh, think it's the right thing to do as a fertility specialist to um, talk about um, egg freezing first up. I generally like patients to consider all their options, um, including uh, whether or not they'd consider having a baby by themselves. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So we can see here that once we get over 38, we're really in serious territory as to whether a, a woman will be able to have a baby at all or not. Um, and um, certainly, uh, you know, we do talk about um, significant reduced risk of having a second baby a couple of years down the line if they do manage to conceive um, in that time. And in terms of the patients I deal with, um, it's important to note that you know women do select themselves out, and couples do. If the fertility is reasonable, then I don't see them; they fall pregnant naturally. So. I see a selected population where the prognosis is actually worse than average. And so lots of people say, oh, I, I have all these patients getting pregnant at you know, 38, 40, what, what, what's the matter? And all the celebrities in the media. Um, but the reality is that you know, those who will conceive do conceive. And they usually the exception rather than the rule. And those who don't conceive, um, you do see more, um, more patients um, coming for help purely because of advanced maternal age and the same patient had they tried a few years earlier might not have needed any assistance at all. So it is something that we should all um, you know, take very seriously. Um, and miscarriage rates also do increase um, as women get older. We know that over 40 at least half of the clinical pregnancies that we detect will end in miscarriage and not in live birth. Um, so um, if you do have your 38 year old patient, you know, refer them quickly for help and hopefully we'll be able to help them. Um, so I think you empower women by discussing options and uh, in terms of this scenario, um, you know, you want to educate women about, uh, about her fertile window and about her, um, her um, treatment options and of course the first treatment option is, well, you don't have to do anything. Um, so you can wait and see and that's number one. Um, in terms of donor sperm conception, uh, in uh, the clinic where I work, uh, there are two routes. You can have a clinic recruited donor or you can have a known donor, so a friend or, or um, someone um, you've met who's willing to, to um, donate sperm so that you can have a baby. It's important to realise that if you bring your own donor, um, that um, 
sperm will be quarantined for a period of time to ensure safe screening for things like HIV and so they can't be immediately used. Uh, VARTA website in Victoria has some fantastic information on all the implications of donor conception and I would encourage you to go there um, for more information from a legal and social perspective. In terms of egg freezing, um, I do offer AMH testing because that will tell a woman what egg freezing may or may not do for her. Um, a question about egg freezing, you know, on average we're talking about a live birth rate of 6% uh, conservatively um, from the literature per frozen egg, um, probably a bit better than that in women who are under 35 and probably a bit worse than that for women who are over 38. Um, so you really need to freeze about 20 or 30 eggs to have a reasonable plan B uh, and most women would achieve, certainly over 35, would achieve um, kind of early double digits or single digits in one cycle so it's really a very big investment. Um, I generally would encourage my patients over 38 to really seriously consider having a baby instead. Um, but obviously, um, you, obviously I wouldn't discriminate against them and if they wanted to freeze their eggs I'd do my very best for them. In terms of referring for specialist advice, um, I think um, it's a good idea for your 38 year old patient um, who might want to have a baby one day to get some um, advice from a fertility specialist. So I'll hand that back to Louise. Okay, thanks Ralia. Um, we need to keep moving along with our case studies because we're running a little bit behind time. Um, so we're now going to look at um, pre-pregnancy planning um, and what the role is here for primary care practitioners. Um, and if you have a look at Stacey and Rob, um, overweight, smoking, um, and we'll start with you, Karen, about how we would approach this couple. Yeah, thank you, Louise. I guess uh, the first thing to say is that this couple has actually done the right thing because they come to see uh, a, a health practitioner before they conceive, and that's a very good good thing to do because that gives you the opportunity to uh, to rectify some some of these uh, risk factors. So uh, it's an opportunity obviously for preconception care because that, that's what they come for and I think one of the, the, the very first things to do is to, to, to establish uh, the, the regularity and, and otherwise the pattern of uh, the, the woman's menstrual cycle. This will give a lot of clues about whether she, she is in fact ovulating and uh, it also is an opportunity to talk about uh, ways of uh, keeping a little bit of tab of, of uh, the periods and uh, if, if down the track things haven't worked out, it, it's, it's a very good record of, um, uh, it, it tells us a lot about where, whether the, this woman is ovulating or not. And, and obviously if she is obese, uh, chances are that she may not be ovulating. It's also an opportunity to talk about um, the fertile window in the menstrual cycle and how timing intercourse to coincide with that is, is um, really going to increase the chances. Now. Uh, I'm just going to quickly refer to uh, these, uh, this diagram for women and there's one for men. It's just a very helpful tool and it does come from the family planning decision tool, the, the APNA tool that I've talked about before and that you can, you can look at. I find it very helpful because it, it really gives um, you know, a roadmap for all the things that we need to cover and, and they, won't take, um, they, they, they will take your whole consultation but I think they, they are a handy reminder to the things that, that really should be covered in a uh, antenatal or, or prenatal cons consultation and this is the one that talks about the, the things we need to remember to talk to men about and I think from now on uh, Sandra is going to go into more detail about the, um, the particular lifestyle and nutrition needs of this particular couple where he's smoking and they're both overweight. So I think it's over to you, Sandra. Right, thanks, Karen. So because this partner, because the male is smoking, <coughs> I would refer him off to um, have some sort of method of trying to stop smoking. That's really important. And because he is smoking, he really will need to be having a a formula, an antenatal formula for men that includes some antioxidants as well with some folic acid and zinc usually included. 
So uh, just reinforce that just even a modest weight loss for um, for Stacey at 5 to 10 percent. She's 29 so the obesity is a bigger factor for her than her age. Her age is she's still at a fertile time. And because they're both obese, I would encourage them to do things together and in particularly exercise. As you can see, the recommended recommendations for weight loss with for exercise and weight loss with obesity is 225 to 300 minutes a week and I would encourage them to do that together. So it's about an hour of good brisk walking five days a week. Because of the um, inflammatory state that is occurring with obesity then you would also encourage a diet like we have which is highlighting a high amount of fruit and vegetables low in the nasty fats and trans fatty acids and saturated fat and more of the good fats that we talked about and particularly for Stacey we would make sure that she was vitamin D replete as obesity increases the needs for vitamin D. Thanks Louise. You can stay there Sandra because we've got the next case study coming up that's coming back to you as well. Um, so this is a um, case study that's focusing on subfertility. Um, so we've got Anna presents um, saying that she's been trying to conceive for about 10 months with no success. So Sandra I'll let you continue on with this one um, and then we'll hand over to Raylia. So this often would be the time when perhaps a couple will attend a naturopath for the first time to see what else they can do and you would absolutely ensure that they were getting all the preconception nutrients. And I just wanted to make the point that the reason why folic acid is started that one month before is that the neural tube um, is the important time for that is between day 17 and 30 of gestation and by day 28 of pregnancy the neural tube is closed so getting in before most women know that they're pregnant pregnant. Absolutely refer to a, a fertility specialist if not already um, managed by a fertility specialist and really looking at that optimization of general health with a good diet, minimizing stress, um, looking at what their exercise, their, their environment is, where they live, what work influences might be and having uh, seeing if there's anything there. Um, stress minimization and management and the main point is is this I would be using herbal medicines and antioxidants and the main point that I would be making here is that I would usually be working collaboratively with a fertility specialist and informing the specialist or the doctor of what I'm actually prescribing and basically that could be because there is an interaction that it could occur or and, um, um, and, and certain medications need to be avoided but usually just so that you know just like um, need to know what the patient is taking and of course avoiding anything that is teratogenic um, that goes without saying. Okay thanks Louise. Hey Raylia we'll come back to you for your recommended management. Okay, so um, recommended management. Um, so obviously lifestyle op optimization is first line. Um, I um, recommend antenatal and genetic screening and this can be offered in the primary care setting. Antenatal screening, routine checking for uh, varicella immunity, rubella immunity, uh, which can be um, addressed if, if immunity is lacking, preconception. Um, also consider genetic screening specifically for things like cystic fibrosis or um, if a patient comes for a particular ethnic group um, like for example thalassemia in Southeast Asians um, or um, you know kind of a sickle cell trait in, in uh, African origins, Tay-Sachs disease in Ashkenazi Jewish population so think about it. Um, we consider that testing for fragile X, spinal muscular atrophy and cystic fibrosis although not government funded is cost effective in general population. Um, address modifiable risk factors. So um, treat subclinical hypothyroidism, it's my practice to do so. The endocrine guidelines um, from the um, Endocrine Society recommend treating to a TSH less than um, 2.5 preconception um, which is my practice. Um, you know, counsel and supportive uh, management for reducing smoking, optimizing weight, diet, antenatal uh, vitamin supplementation. Um, and in terms of supervised conservative management, um, I like to be there for patients in terms of um, you know, making sure that there is a, a line in the sand 
um, that at which they they would more, want more help, making sure that you, you check in with them regularly, see how they're going, give them um, you know kind of uh, encouragement to continue if, if, if with conservative management if if that is um, indicated. Like for example, in a couple with um, you know three to six months of unexplained infertility, where semen analysis is normal and ovulation is occurring and there's no suspected pathology, you know, it's it's a good practice to, to encourage them to continue and give them advice about timing um, of intercourse and, and help them along in that way and, and many of those couples will conceive. Um, I would urge also to continue to consider family aspirations and how many children that couple want or, or that woman wants um, in the timing of referral. Um, if a woman is 35 and she would like to have two or three children, then she really needs to get a move on and, and um, have that first baby. Um, this is a slide about semen analysis and normal parameters. Um, so you can see um, this is the imperfect test. Uh, it's generated from a study by the WHO that looked at um, men whose couple, whose um, partner conceived in less than 12 months of trying spontaneously, and it's the these um, numbers come from the lower fifth centile of that population. So it's not a functional test; it's an epidemiological test, um, and um, on the basis of it, there's plenty of people who do conceive naturally, and if you do their semen analysis, one parameter or more might be um, below normal on a given day. Um, a, a lot of different factors can influence this test. And it does fluctuate with things like having a fever or having a, an illness, a general health um, uh, problem, a hormonal imbalance. So it's important to do this test on two occasions, six weeks apart before um, rushing to conclusion. Sometimes getting a male partner to give a sample once can be a bit of a challenge, but, but that's what I'd recommend you do. Um, certainly if you have a severe issue with um, reduced motility or a severe issue with um, uh, low forms that are um, that's persistent, ICSI can do a lot for a couple like that. Um, so it is important to just um, you know think twice when you get that sperm test. Is there something underlying it? Because a lot of a lot of us jump to the conclusion, oh, bad sperm, go to IVF, that'll fix the problem. But sometimes there are reversible causes and we have to consider is there something else going on. Make sure you do do a um, testicular examination. It's a peak age um, for um, development of testicular cancer in the early 30s. Um, and sometimes that can be the reason that the sperm's compromised. So it's important to examine the male partner. Think of lifestyle modification. You know, is is the guy you know riding a bike, you know, 30 k's a day? Is he, um, you know, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day? Is there anything that could be modified? Is there a hypothalamic problem? Is there an underlying hormonal problem? Um, is there something that we can do to improve um, his chances of um, spontaneous conception, or to pick up something else serious that might be going on? And if the answer is no, that's when you choose IVF. Uh, endometriosis is something that we can assess uh, in women. I find that there's um, in the literature an 80% strike rate of finding endometriosis in a woman who's had unexplained infertility and ends up having a laparoscopy, even without significant symptoms of dyspareunia or dysmenorrhea. Um, there can be very poor correlation between symptoms and, and disease severity, but we also know that treating um, mild deposits of endometriosis that can't be detected on ultrasound can improve a couple's chance of not only IVF but also spontaneous conception, so it's worth it. Um, not everybody needs a laparoscopy, however, so choosing operative candidates sensibly um, does concentrate the benefit. In terms of ovarian reserve assessment, um, the best way of doing this is not only the AMH but also doing a dynamic assessment with ultrasound and at the same time you have the opportunity to assess for other anatomical um, issues such as endometrial polyps that might act like an IUD, uh, fibroids specifically that might distort the uterine cavity or hydrosalpinges which might indicate a previous infection that might have been subclinical of something like chlamydia. Um, we know that with hydrosalpinges you're better off without your fallopian tubes. If you have bilateral hydrosalpinges, IVF success is increased if you do a salpingectomy first. 
Um, so uh, an antral follicle count can tell you a little bit also about um, pathology. If it's very, very high, maybe we're dealing with polycystic ovarian syndrome. AMH is also going to be part of the diagnostic criteria, I believe, for polycystic ovarian syndrome in the future, and a cutoff that um, you know kind of indicates um, that that's probably a concern is over 35 on the AMH. The treatment options, um, ovulation induction, I recommend specialist monitoring. Um, it's essential in Victoria because you need to have a licence as a gynaecologist to prescribe Clomid. Um, but really when we're talking about ovulation induction, we're talking about multiple follicles and in vivo conception and there's a risk of multiple pregnancy, both twin and higher order multiple pregnancy. It needs to be monitored by ultrasound. There needs to be responsible cycle cancellation if multiple follicles develop. IUI is um, of some but limited benefit um, over spontaneous conception. Um, and IVF really comes into its own if there's a severe sperm problem attributable factor of infertility or unexplained infertility in younger women. Pre-implantation genetic screening, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is a powerful tool, particularly of avoiding inherited diseases that run in families, recessive diseases, dominant conditions, um, complex genetic diseases like mitochondrial diseases can be um, avoided in the offspring using PGD. But we can also likewise screen embryos um, for their aneuploidy or, ploidy or euploid status and make sure that um, in high risk populations only normal embryos go back. That does reduce the time to conception for uh, women with a high risk of aneuploidy um, by making sure that um, only normal or, or only embryos that are tra transferred uh, with the normal number of chromosomes um, have a, a good chance of becoming a baby. And of course, what happens if you can't have a baby with your own egg? You can always use a donor egg. As a single person, same-sex couples can use donor sperm. And of course, you can use a donor embryo from an RVF program um, from a couple who've completed their family and have leftover embryos. Unexplained infertility is often complex. It may be partner-specific. It may be age-specific. It's really important that we investigate um, couples fully before calling it unexplained. Um, and we know that IVF and PGD can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic because you see in the lab what's happening when egg meets sperm and you can make a lot of, um, a lot of um, informative choices on future treatments based on what you see. Okay, so I'll hand that back to Louise to um, uh, ask our questions. Okay, great. We do have some time for um, a few questions. So we might just start with one um, that's asking about complementary therapies. Sandra, I'll just start with you. So looking at acupuncture, reflexology, homeopathy, traditional Chinese medicine and the evidence for their use in infertility and preconception care. Now I know that's quite a big one, but maybe just a general comment from you might be useful, please. Okay, so the, the in some cases there isn't any evidence on some of those therapies and in other cases there's different um, results depending on the study. Um, part of the issue is is testing some of those therapies in a standard kind of um, scientific arena. Um, so um, I guess the point to make is that there's not always enough information, not enough evidence that would satisfy um, to make it an evidence-based um, uh, an evidence-based therapy to choose. I guess um, I guess that's all a I want to say, but it can have some other benefits. So there are some studies going on with Melbourne IVF at the moment and, and having acupuncture to look at seeing what the outcomes of concurrent acupuncture might have on um, fertility outcomes. So there is certainly research being done. Thanks, Lou. Okay. Um, Laura, we might just have everybody up on screen because it might be easier when I'm going to be sending questions. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, so this one is about the ovulation predictor kits from pharmacies. So it might be one for you, Rayleigh. I think this come in a couple of times actually. And what role do these ovulation predictor kits have? Um, so I think they have a limited role if you have a perfect 28-day menstrual cycle. 
uh, because in that case scenario when your ovulate is fairly predictable and you can use other um, low cost measures like cervical mucus monitoring and basal body temperature. However, if you have a, a patient who has irregular cycles but does still ovulate, it can be really um, frustrating for them timing intercourse to have a baby. Uh, and in, in patients like that, for example, with um, the spectrum of polycystic ovarian syndrome, I think they're very useful. Um, it's also useful to know that there are lower cost alternatives to over-the-counter ovulation tests um, that can be um, ordered online in um, larger quantities. Okay, thank you. Um, there was also a question regarding um, the use of metformin as part of fertility optimization. That's probably another one for you too, Rayleigh. I use metformin often. I use it in the context of polycystic ovarian syndrome um, where part of the pathology is due to an insulin resistant stage. Um, and there have been lots of studies looking at metformin versus clomiphene and the combined effects. Um, I do think that metformin does give an advantage to some women with severe polycystic ovarian syndrome. It also can help um, metabolic risk. Um, so I do use it quite often. Also there have been studies that show that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome who do for other reasons like malfactor require IVF um, on metformin the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is significantly reduced. So um, that would be the context. And I think it would be very reasonable for GPs who are used to prescribing metformin as first line in diabetes um, to also prescribe in fertility patients in that, in that, group, in that patient group. Okay, great. Um, there was also a question too um, earlier, and I'm sorry if I might have missed if you did say it, but just in regard to sperm tests being reliably done by any lab, or you know, we've got we'll have people all over Australia and overseas too listening to the webinar. So just your opinion on you know the ideal. Um, so you know, in an ideal world, which um, a lot of us you know can't can't necessarily have access to. We'd use a specialist andrology lab and we'd make sure that samples um, are collected under ideal conditions, so two to seven days abstinence um, before sample collection and making sure that the samples in the lab within one hour of collection and analyse. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world and I still think it's, it's worthwhile for primary care to be the place where the first semen analysis is done. So, um, you know, kind of my practical world view would be to refer to uh, the lab you normally use um, and just give the patient instructions um, to have the best possible outcome in that circumstance. And are there any other tests that you'd follow up after the semen analysis in terms of male testing? Well, I, I personally examine my patients. Um, I do a testicular exam for, for my male patients. Um, if I'm the, I often I often receive a semen analysis that's already done um, from primary care, which is great, um, you know. But some diagnoses can be made on a on a testicular examination. Like for example, you never miss a patient with Klinefelter syndrome who has a one mil testis if you do a testicular examination. Um, so it's it's worth doing that, and, and kind of in primary care certainly investigating both partners. Um, fertility problems. Are, we think 50 of you know kind of at least 50 percent of fertility problems that couples experience have a male factor, and in 30 percent it's the only factor um, that we identify in testing. So it's a big part of the equation. And look, probably one last one, and we'll have to leave it there. Um, and these have all been directed at you, Raylia, but um, it's an important one. And you mentioned the testing the patency of fallopian tubes, um, and is this common practice in primary care? Yeah, so look, I don't think it is common practice in primary care, but I think, you know, a lot of primary care doctors do testing for chlamydia and find patients to be positive. And if such a patient is trying to conceive, um, it would be very reasonable for a, a general practitioner when they do often refer for pelvic ultrasounds to refer, refer for a tubal patency assessment. And there's a lot, if, if you happen to live in, in, in Melbourne or a metro centre, there are lots of um, specialist women's ultrasound centres where that can be performed by what's called a high cosy or a foam tubal patency assessment. In other centres, region and rural, you can do an HSG which is an, which is an x-ray test um, where contrast is used and that's, um, that's often more accessible in, in that context. But yeah, I think it's definitely relevant to do in primary care 
if you're suspicious of tubal factor infertility. Um, so I'd just really like to thank Your Fertility for, for partnering with Jean Hales to present tonight's webinar. I think the number of registrations is testament to the importance of the topic and your need for information as health professionals in primary care. So thanks to our fantastic panel. I think they've all contributed really important information in their, in their area. Our next webinar is on June 21 and the topic will be endometriosis. So the person that asked the question about endometriosis earlier, you'll have to come back on the 21st of June and find out the answers then. So thanks very much for attending and we hope we'll see you again for Jean Hale's webinar programs. Thank you.